without the fans, there is none of this. Wednesday, August 9th. I'm so honored to be here. Baby, you're a rock star. America's biggest super fans meet their superstar idols. Yeah! <laughs> and compete for a once-in-a-lifetime prize. That is correct! I'm going to take them through my new record, song by song. You can pick a song, and we can sing it together on stage. And the title of Ultimate Superfan. It is up to you, America. Superfan. Superfan premieres Wednesday, August 9th on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Superfan. I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the Prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, we look at what Jay Wilds told the police. and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, by my streaky co-host, Alice. <laughs> a joke only <laughs> for Patreon. So, <laughs> so if you're not a patron, we never ask you to join not Patreon. Asking you to now. And I'm not telling you. In fact, I'm telling you <laughs> to not join Patreon so you don't understand that pun. And don't you guys ever say that we try to get you to join Patreon, because I'm telling you right now, run away. Run far, exactly. far away, run away from Patreon. <laughs> run away. <laughs> anyway, so this is episode nine in our add on <laughs> coverage, and we're getting a little loopy if you guys haven't noticed. It's episode six in our outline, so that shows you how far behind we are, but that's okay. It doesn't feel like episode nine. You know, sometimes we do these these sort of long series, and like some of the middle ones, it's like, we need to do this because we need to talk about this, but it kind of feels like a slog. You know, I know I shouldn't say that, but it does sometimes. But I feel like this has not been that way. Maybe it's just me. I don't know what you, I don't know what you think, Alice. No, I mean, I, I remember, and maybe it's like a different state of life to you. I remember when we were recording John Bonet Ramsey, and that was like our longest at the time, and that felt like forever, but I can't believe we're already on episode nine because I feel like we just started and there's still more to talk about, a lot more to talk about. And partly, I will say this, a, unlike John Bonet Ramsey, I think a lot of what we need to talk about is because there's been so much attention on this case and there's a lot of misinformation or misinterpretation of what the information is rather than a lot of evidence to go through. John Bonet Ramsey, there really was like a lot of different aspects to consider with, you know, how the body was found and, and, and whatnot here. I feel like we've spent a lot of time talking about what other podcasts have said, you know, what has been the misconception, what has been the taking the different, juxtaposing the different testimonies from different people at different times, who's lying, who's not trying to parse through that. And that's what's taking so much time. But I think it's very worthy because there's so much discussion about it. And Really, what we've always wanted to do is just try to get as close to the truth as possible. And it gets harder when there's a lot of kind of talking heads talking about the evidence. I think that's evidence. absolutely right. John Bonet, we could have done twice as many episodes if we wanted to. There's just so much stuff out there. I and mean, actually, it might not have seemed like it for those of you listening, but we actually were pretty restrained in, in what we did. Here, I think we're going through almost everything. And one of the reasons is, like Alice said, we just kind of want to give it to you. So you can make up your own mind. We're going to do the same thing today. We're going to go through Jay's two statements to the police. And we're just going to, we're not going to read you a lot of what he said verbatim, but we're going to go through sort of a summary of what he said in both statements. And, and you'll see where some of the distinctions are and some of the differences are. But I think this is obviously important. Jay's your main witness. Last week, we went through Jen Pusateri's story. And I'm sure you remember most of that. And today we're going to say what Jay said. And this all started on February 28th for Jay. It really started on February 27th. February 27th is the day that Jen comes to the police and she gives them their story. And they immediately go out to find Jay after this. And they find him at his video store at about 1130 at night. And they say, hey, you need to come with us. And by the time they get to the station, the calendar has flipped over to February 28th. So that's sort of where we're at. 
when this statement begins. And we're just going to dive in. We're just going to dive into the statement and basically what was said and sort of how it went down. And then we'll talk about the second statement as well. Yeah. And it makes a lot of sense that they immediately go out that night to look for Jay. Because if you remember from our last episode, talking about Jen Pusateri's interview, her second interview with her lawyer and her mom, Everything she's telling the police is coming from Jay. So it's hearsay for her, but all her information comes from Jay. So, of course, let's go to the horse's mouth and figure out what's going on. So the police bring in Jay and detectives McGillivary and Ritz interview him as well. Now, Jay explains that the day of the murder, Adnan had picked him up to take him to the mall to buy a present for Jay's girlfriend, Stephanie. Jay was going to then use Adnan's car the rest of the day. And at this point, Adnan asks him to pick him up later. Adnan also gives Jay his cell phone and tells him that he'll call Jay on that cell phone since Jay didn't have a cell phone. Adnan also drops a bit of a bombshell when they're going shopping and he's doing this whole car and cell phone handoff. Adnan tells Jay he's going to kill Hay. Now, Jay does not believe him. The conversation began while discussing girlfriends. Makes sense, right? Because they're going shopping for Jay's girlfriend. And while they're discussing girlfriends, Adnan says, quote, I can't believe what Hay did to me. Broke my heart like that. She'd been heartless and cruel, he thought, especially in the way she stopped the relationship. Adnan says, I'm going to do it. I'm going to kill that bitch. So when Jay's recounting this to the police, again, he's saying he said it to me, but like he could have been blowing off steam. I didn't really take him seriously at that point. So Jay drops off Adnan at school and drives Adnan's car to Jen Pusateri's house, though he describes it as Mark's house. Mark is Jen's brother. Jen arrives 15 minutes later and they all play video games. At around 3.45 p.m., Jay has a conversation with Adnan. He'd expected this call around 3 p.m. as that was the time Adnan told him to expect the call. Adnan tells Jay to come pick him up off Edmondson Avenue. There's some inside baseball here. Edmondson Avenue drops away as the meeting location once Jay changes his story to Best Buy. But at this point, he's talking about Edmondson Avenue. But according to Jay's friend, Chris, who Jay says he told the story to before the police came looking for him, Jay told him that Jay and Adnan initially met at a pool hall. There were not one, but two pool halls on Edmondson. They were Blue Jays and VIPs. And in fact, they were near Patapso State Park. This could explain a lot of the story, though you'd have to account for the lack of a cell phone ping in this area. So this could be the result of a cell tower bleed over, but that's just speculation. So that's a little inside baseball, but we'll go back to the story from here. So Adnan gets out of the car and Jay sees that Adnan's wearing red gloves. Jay thinks this is strange, and he asks him what he's doing walking around with gloves on. Adnan says, I did it. I did it. You don't effing believe me? I did it. He then opens the trunk of the car and says, she's all blew up in there in the trunk. Jay looks in the trunk, and there is where he sees Hay Min Lee. Jay knew Hay because he sat next to her in biology class. Jay said Hay was wearing a black skirt and a white blouse and stockings. And when police recover her body, Hay is wearing a black skirt, a gray blouse, and stockings, along with a white jacket that buttons at the front. So there's a lot there. You know, this Edmondson Avenue thing is always interesting because Jay does change that part of the story. In the Patapsco State Park thing, those of you who listen to Serial know at some point Jay's going to talk about going to Patapsco State Park with Adnan. And Sarah Koenig notes that really it would have been impossible for him to do that when he says he did it. And this, what I love about this case is in some ways this case is very simple and straightforward, but in other ways it's, it's complicated in the way that every case ever is complicated. And it just proves the notion that no matter how much you know about what happened in a case, you'll just never know everything. And exactly what happened that day, even if Adnan's guilty and they got the right guy and he should be in prison and Jay's more or less telling the truth, exactly what happened that day is impossible to know. And one of the reasons is you get sort of these differing stories from Jay, what he tells the police, what he tells Jen, what he tells his friends. And I don't know. I think it's interesting, but I don't know how important it is. It's just one of those things where there are these little bits of the story that Jay's telling and they're going to change. 
and why exactly they change. Sometimes it's hard to say. Sometimes it's easy to say. For instance, in this story, he's saying Adnan told him that day. Later on, he's going to say Adnan told him the day before. Pretty obvious why you would change that. Day before seems a lot more like an accomplice to murder. Day of seems a lot more like, oh, you know, I didn't believe him. Day before sounds like you planned it with him. Day of sounds like it's more sort of spontaneous. Some of the other stuff, a little bit harder to say, but, you know, I think it's interesting that Jay seems to know what Hay was wearing. A lot of this, it's funny because you talk about this and you're like, oh, that's really intriguing that he says this thing that fits so well. Obviously, the people who think Adnan's innocent will tell you, yeah, that's because the police told him everything and they completely fed him this story and that's why he knew. They probably told him exactly what Hay was wearing when she was uncovered and that's how he knew. And I guess, you know, that's possible. Yeah, the what she was wearing thing, you know, is is very intriguing. I mean, I think there's probably a lot of truth in this first statement, but when you're putting it kind of in context with what Jen just told the police the day before... There's probably some, you can already see some shades of, well, that doesn't quite jive. Remember, Jen said that while they were playing video games, he was waiting for a call around three and he told Jen this. And during that entire time that they were playing video games, Jen said that Jay wasn't acting like himself, like he was acting very agitated or kind of nervous. Well, if you didn't think Adnan was being serious and you weren't actually waiting for a call to pick him up after he'd murdered his girlfriend... It doesn't really make sense that you'd be nervous. At the same time, borrowing someone's car all day and their phone as just a, hey, why don't you just hang on to these for me? This story still doesn't quite answer all those questions because this is not something that Adnan did for Jay regularly. It seemed like a one-time thing. It was a new cell phone. And his story doesn't quite account for why. Why, If you already went to the mall with Adnan to buy a present for Stephanie, why did you need his car longer you know why did you need his cell phone for that if you were going to be with jen why not just have adnan call jen's house or jen's you know pager or just page him and so a lot of questions are still in the air even in this first statement yeah it's it's true adnan's story doesn't really make sense on that level jay didn't really need his car i mean if they went to the mall he should just bought him a gift and then jay could have just dropped him and his car off at the school and walked home jay didn't live that far away from the school he walked a lot of places he had taken a bus you know, so that is something that I've always thought was interesting, too. It makes a lot more sense for Jay to have the car if there's some sort of murder going on. Doesn't prove anything, but it's one of those little quirks of the case. So at this point, you know, Jay sees this body and he and Adnan start to argue. And Jay says they argued so much that they're starting to attract attention, which is obviously not good when you have a body in the car in front of you. At this point, Adnan tells him to get into Adnan's car and to follow him. So Adnan is driving Hay's car. Jay is driving Adnan's car. They drive to a park and ride on Route 70. This is part of the story that always stays the same. Adnan parks the car, and then he gets in with Jay. At this point, according to Jay, they drive to these cliffs on River Road. This is Patapsco State Park, and they smoke a blunt. They sort of wax philosophical about what Adnan has done. Jay then drives Adnan back to school. He says the sun is setting at this point. At some point around 6.45, Jay says he goes to pick up Adnan. They grab something to eat at McDonald's as Adnan is breaking his fast because this is Ramadan. And at this point, Adnan gets a call from the police and they let him know that Hay didn't pick up her cousin and want to know if he has any idea where she is. At this point, Adnan becomes frantic. They go to Jay's house and pick up a shovel and a pick. They then go get Hay's car at the park and ride and drive it to Leakin Park, which is very close. I mean, the park and ride is basically just a little north of Leakin Park. And we'll post some, you know, maps and everything. There are a lot of maps online people have done where they've actually marked all this stuff, and you can find those, and those are pretty useful, and, and you should check those out to get sort of a lay of the land. Adnan parks Hay's car and gets her body out of the trunk and carries it into the woods. And Jay is like, I'm not going to help you do any of this. Jay then follows Adnan, and Adnan jokes that she was heavy. He starts to vomit at this point, but then he tells Jay, I have to bury her. They argue again because Jay doesn't want to help Adnan, and Adnan wants him to help, but they end up going into the woods. Jay parks in front of what he calls a highway divider and what the police call jersey walls. These are those concrete barriers that you sometimes see on the interstate when when the police are doing construction of some, or the police, when highway workers are doing some sort of construction. And in fact, there was one right in front of where Hay was buried. 
and there were some also wood posts. Jay says he sees Hayes' blue and red nylon jacket on the ground. It's actually unclear whether this was Hayes' jacket or somebody else's jacket, but Jay says he sees it. Jay says he goes back to where Hay had put the body. He had laid her against a log and started to dig. And in fact, there was a log right next to where Hay was buried. In fact, Alonzo Sellers talks about this log. Everybody pretty much talks about this log that was laying there right near where the grave was. Jay describes the area as a marshy area, maybe an old riverbed. He says there's a log with a palm tree and a whole bunch of old brush around. It's a pretty accurate description of the burial location. Now, Jay is equivocal about who digs the hole. At one point, he actually says he does. At another point, he says Adnan did it, and it was just Adnan. It's pretty obvious that both of them did this, and he also notes that Adnan is vomiting again while this is going on. He says at some point, he sits on the log and starts smoking a cigarette while Adnan is digging. It took about half an hour to dig the grave, which actually seems pretty fast to me. I don't know if you've ever had to dig a hole before, but it takes a while. But he says... Not a very deep hole. When the hole is finished... And in January, at that. I know it was a warm day, but, like, it's been cold, and so there's, like, frosting, and, you know, the ground is probably not very saturated, so this is actually pretty fast. That's an excellent point. You know, the ground would have been difficult to dig in. They probably would have needed that pick that they brought as well. He says that Adnan puts her body in face first, which is also consistent with how her body was found. If you remember our discussion when we talked about liver mortis, that's, that's how she's found face down. Photos indicate she's wearing this this white sort of cardigan-y thing. I guess it's more like a sweater that opens at the front. I'm not very good with clothing. <laughs> but And if she had a blue and red nylon jacket, it was not found. It wasn't buried with her. So that's the one Jay mentioned. He didn't say that she was wearing it. He just said that he saw it. Nevertheless, not found. Jay says the hole's not deep. Jay describes it as about shin deep. The police interpret this as about two feet deep, but Jay thinks it's more like a foot. Measurement is kind of like time. People are terrible at it. I seriously doubt it was only a foot deep because a foot's actually not that far. So it probably is more like two feet. But either way, not a very deep grave. And it's not surprising that Hay's hair would have been sticking out of the ground when Alonzo Sellers found her. The police asked Jay several times exactly what his involvement was in this whole affair. And I think you're right, Brett. I think he obviously did probably do some digging. He just doesn't want to say how much involvement he had. Because remember, one of the first things he tells Jen to do in Jen's interview from the day before, she says that they drive back to the dumpster to go wipe off, you know, the shovels. Of course, his fingerprints might be on it, but because... They're his, and he probably touched it at some point. But in your mind, if you've been doing some digging, you're like, I've left so much of my fingerprints on it, I need to go erase all of the evidence. So the fact that that was part of Jen's testimony, I think he probably did at least do a fair bit of digging. But Jay still says that he did not touch Hay's body and didn't help put her into the hole. He says that she was face down, sort of on her right side with her arm twisted behind her back. And Adnan threw up again, and then they covered her with dirt. Jay says that Hay was not wearing any shoes, and the police asked Jay about that, and he said that Adnan told Jay he left them in the car. There's a great irony here, of course. Hay's shoes were found in the back of her car, and those shoes were tested for DNA. The only hits were for unidentified trace DNA that did not match Adnan or anyone else in the case. Of course, if Hay either took them off uh, or a glove wearing Adnan handled them, it would be consistent both with the story Jay is telling and the DNA findings of the state. Jay also says it's dark and has been dark for a couple of hours. Still, Jay said it wasn't too dark. He couldn't say read a book, but he could count on his hand if he wanted to. That's a very specific way of describing how the light is. So specific, in fact, that this feels true. Right. Like he, he's remembering in his mind just how dark it is. He doesn't have a watch with him. He doesn't know what time it is, but he is remembering back to that day. And I mean, this is an incredibly vivid description. I can't read a book because it's too dark, but my fingers in front of me, if I had to count, I could count because there's just kind of the last rays of light. Yeah. And it's it's one of those things. We talk about this a lot. Try and, you know, you read a transcript or even if you listen to these interviews and they're generally available, it's so hard to determine whether or not someone's telling the truth or not. We work a lot with agents who are well-trained in interviewing people and, and trying to detect lies. And the number of times where we've had a discussion with somebody and they leave and we all kind of sit around and we're like, okay, what do you think? Were they telling the truth or not? And one person will say, well, I think they were 
absolutely telling the truth. And somebody else is like, they lied about every single thing. And it's just funny because you're trying to figure it out. And things like this are things that stick out to me as well. And it's so poetic, right? Like that's not that's not part of a song. It, those are not lyrics to a song. That's not from a book. Like it's so poetic that it seems to be his way of trying to describe something that exists only in his mind to those on the outside. It's that kind of description that rings very true. You know, who knows what else he lied about, but like what he's talking about that time of day and obviously like the consistency of how her body is in the grave and everything, it it just rings incredibly true here. And you know, it's, it's funny because if you come to this case and you reach a point where you decide it's either Jay or Adnan, it's like you listen to this story and you can almost imagine in a movie where they do like two reenactments. In one reenactment, it's both of them digging the hole. It's like, it's like Fight Club, right? You guys ever see Fight Club? If you haven't, I'm about to spoil it for you. So in Fight Club, Edward Norton and Brad Pitt's characters are actually the same person. And he's undergone this sort of like, he has multiple personalities. And so he's like seeing Brad Pitt doing things, but in fact, it's him doing it. And you watch the whole movie and it's both of them. And then towards the end, when you realize this, they show scenes where it's just Edward Norton and Brad Pitt's not there. And you can almost imagine the recreation. Like there's one scene with both of them digging the hole, Adnan and Jay. And then the other recreation, you know, Adnan just kind of disappears away and it's just Jay digging the hole. And I guess if you think Adnan did it, or you think Adnan didn't do it, but you think Jay did, then you could say, well, of, of course these details ring true because they are true because he was there, but he was the only one there. When we get to, to theories, we're going to talk about that. The theory that Jay did it alone is definitely a theory that a lot of people have. One really quick note on that, on the two versions of that, and that's a great description using Fight Club to describe what could have happened here, is the amount of times Jay is saying that somebody threw up, in his story, it's Adnan throwing up, right? Because it would be consistent that the person who did the murdering probably has the most cortisol running through their body, and throwing up is a very common biological response when you're under a lot of stress or something major has happened whether you think you're upset or not. It's just a kind of reaction. And so it seems that someone at this burial scene was throwing up. And if they are digging and able to dig a hole within about 30 minutes and it's still light enough, we have, you know, these cell phone pings, so we kind of have an idea of when they are there. And it's really short enough, 30 minutes seems about right, actually, that it was still light enough for him to be able to see his hands. Someone was throwing up. And it seems like it needed to be two people, one person throwing up and one person being able to dig to be able to finish digging this grave aspect of the crime before the sun went down too fast. In other words, I don't think that only one person could have been there. I do think that someone was throwing up. Could have been Adnan, could have been Jay. You know, Jay says it's Adnan, but I do think someone's throwing up. And if you're throwing up a lot, it is hard to dig. So you kind of need another set of hands. And one other thing I'll say about the ability to see. So obviously there's going to be an ice storm the next day. I'm not sure how much it snowed or how much ice is on the ground at this time. Those of you who live in a place where it snows know. I'm not exactly sure why this is, why this phenomenon happens. But whenever there's ice or snow on the ground, it's always brighter. Somehow the ice and the snow like gathers whatever light there is and like reflects it back to you. So I always wonder about that too. It literally does. It literally reflects like where you can get like when I lived in Connecticut, I could get like tans from like the snow reflecting the sunlight, even though there was very little sunlight. Like I would be like, why am I like a little bit sunburned? It was snow burned from the reflection, but it would feel like mirrors were on the ground, making it seem lighter at times. So at this point, Hay's been buried. The two of them get back in their respective cars and they start driving, looking for a place to drop the car. They consider dropping it at a strip club called Belvedere, but Adnan didn't like that spot. So they drove back across town and left the car on a side street near Route 40. But Adnan didn't like that place either, so they moved the car again. This time, Adnan gets out of the car with a lot of Hayes' stuff, including possibly her book bag and purse, and maybe the jacket. It's unclear. Jay describes the location of the car as in the back of a bunch of row homes on a parking lot on the west side of Baltimore County. Jay says that he would often swing by the location to see if the car was still there in the weeks that followed. At this point, Adnan gets in the car with Jay, and Jay starts driving towards home. They stopped at one of the dumpsters behind Westview Mall and dumped all of Hayes' stuff, including the keys to her car, in the dumpster in the back near a movie theater. The shovel and the pick went in the dumpster as well. In the weeks after the murder, Adnan and Jay discussed it about a dozen times. Adnan reminded Jay that he couldn't tell Stephanie about what happened since Adnan was really close to her. 
He also made light of the whole circumstance. Jay said that in one conversation, Adnan told him that he strangled Hay. He said that it happened in the car and Hay struggled and kicked. At one point, she kicked the steering column and kicked off the windshield wiper thing. Jay didn't know how he got Hay in the car with him in the first place. In another conversation, Adnan said he wanted Jay to go back to the body with him. Adnan had become concerned that they hadn't covered the body enough, but Jay said he did not go. In the last conversation, Jay told Adnan that he heard the police were looking for Jay. Adnan told him to stay calm and everything would be fine. Adnan also told him he knew a West Side hitman, implying he should keep his mouth shut. The police weren't the only people Jay told about this West Side hitman. A coworker at the porn store would say that Jay also told him he was worried about a West Side hitman. I mean, that's that's like a detail that's so dumb that it also feels like you didn't make it up. Like this whole West Side hitman thing. And maybe there was a West Side hitman. I don't know. But it feels like something Jay was actually concerned about, not something that he just made up to make the police believe the story more. But Right, right. The the whole someone he works with, when you're working, you, they're long hours, you just say whatever you want. This is totally believable. Uh, it makes this, this part of the story so much more believable that someone he worked with was like, yeah, Jay mentioned something about a West Side hitman that he was worried about. I mean, that's pretty, you know, he, he didn't know that this person would ever talk to the police. So I don't think Jay was trying to plant different nuggets to, you know, bolster his story at this point. Right. And if you were, if you're really looking to make sure the police believed you, you probably would have told like your priest or something, not your buddy at the porn star. Right. During the interview, the police noted for the record that before they began recording, they talked to Jay for 30 to 45 minutes. And they had Jay admit that the initial conversation had not been as forthcoming as the recorded one. In the previous conversation, Jay had denied many things and disassociated himself from the case while also introducing a lot of inconsistencies. And Jay said that he'd been scared. Really quick on that, Brett and I said in a previous episode that 30 to 45 minutes of talking to a witness is really not that long. I will say when you first meet a witness, especially for the first interview, there's a lot of introductions kind of. It's not like a nice to meet you, but you're both trying to feel each other out, right? You're trying to figure out how you're going to interview this person. Are you going to go in hard charging and being like, hey, we talked to Jen Pusateri, your ass is, you know, nailed to the wall. Or are you going to try to make friends with him and be the nice cop and try to, you know, woo him into telling you all the details? You're trying to figure out what's going on. And if you've ever talked to a stranger before, you can tell that 30 minutes is not that long and trying to feel each other out, especially in an interrogation setting, especially if. Jay comes in and starts telling just like a wacamamie story that is inconsistent. It is, you know, false on so many levels. It doesn't even make sense in and of itself. And, you know, then paired with what the police believe, you can imagine they let him just talk. They spout. We do this all the time. They spout. He spouts for like 15 minutes. He can't even stop to take a breath. And when he stops, they're like, all right, look, everything you said was bull. And here's why we know it's bull. So are you going to actually talk to us or not? Are you wasting our time? And... Then he's like, okay, fine. You know, when we confront people with their inconsistencies, their lies, sometimes, not all the times, they'll be like, okay, fine, fine, fine. Give me a second. Okay, I'm ready to talk. And that happens a good bit. And it would make sense if Jay said that he said that other story or he was not forthcoming because he was scared. Yeah, he just been, you know, it's after midnight. He just got dragged in from the police and he knows he did something wrong. You know, what exactly he did wrong may be up for debate, but like, it, he's not this like, you know, clean as a whistle kind of guy coming in. So he's coming in to talk to the police and it's not going to be pretty. So all to say is a lot of people put a lot of stock into this 30 to 45 minutes before they started the recording. And that's when all the coaching happened. Just remember, this is the first time Jay is like with the police. This is not like the eighth time. So they are meeting each other for the first time. There are a lot of like pleasantries. There's a lot of meeting each other. Think about if in 30 minutes you had to both meet each other, build so much rapport that the police are like, we know the whole story. Here's the whole story. Here's why you should trust us. And here's how we're going to feed you information. And you're going to memorize all of these facts. And then we're going to press record and you're going to say it all. And this all happens in 30 minutes. Is that possible? Perhaps. Very unlikely, though. Very unlikely. In 30 minutes, I barely get started with one of my witnesses. 
I mean, truly, it, there is so much like, where'd you go to school? Oh, you played football? What did you play? Oh, have you watched the, you know, whatever? Who your, who's your team? I mean, there's so much just laying the groundwork. They are strangers when they meet. And the theory that he's being coached by the police during this time, you'd have to believe they're going from strangers to earning complete trust in Jay to coaching him, to him remembering what to say, and then for them to press record. That's a lot to happen. And you can believe that happened, but all those steps had to happen before they pressed record if you think that the police fed him all the lines. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, you know, that's exactly what would have had to have happened, right? Like, if you think that, if you think that this is all a police conspiracy, both Adnan and Jay are innocent, it's a police conspiracy. Basically, you, you have to believe that in those 35 to 40 minutes, they they bring Jay in and they're like, okay, here's the thing. Jen Pusteri just came in. We fed her this story. We're going to tell you the same story. You better give us this story back exactly how we want you to so we can go get Adnan because we've decided it's him and we're going to get him and we need your help. And if you don't, then we'll frame you. So that's what's going to happen. Not, there's no no introductions here. No, no, you know, no sweet talking. That's what's going to happen. Learn your script because in 30 minutes we're turning on the recorder. And at that point, you better nail it. And the recorded the recorded interview is longer than the prep time. Right. Like we when we prep a witness for the stand, which is completely proper. Right. You want to prep your witnesses. We prep them like I would say at least three to five times longer than they're actually on the stand. Right. You like go through documents. You talk to them. You explain how like it answers happen. And like you have to fill in all the holes. It's not just like question, answer, question, answer. This is a story that he's telling. So there, there are gaps in between. Remember the whole, I can't read a book, but I can count my fingers. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things that need to fill in the cracks for this to be a believable story. And so to kind of fit all that in, in a time when the recorded session that he's talking is much longer than they have to prep him. That's something to keep in mind. And just to give you a little bit for, for those of you who are listening to this live, to give you a little bit of a sense of how quickly time passes when two people are like shooting the breeze. Brett and I shot the breeze. We know each other very well. We talk every day. We record all the time. We shot the breeze for 15 minutes with you guys listening to us before we started recording the episode. And before we even went live on this to record, we shot the breeze for about another five or seven minutes. So we were talking to each other for 20 minutes. And I looked down at the clock and I was like, oh, we should probably start actually recording the episode. That was basically the amount of time the police had with Adnan before they pushed record. Yeah, I mean, this recording on our little broadcast here has been going on 39 minutes. So basically, the police would have had to have been done by now, telling him what to say. For And he would have had to have gotten it and gotten it right. And the other thing that would be weird about this is the police built in the attack for the defense because Jay doesn't come clean initially. Like, why say that? Why not say Jay came in and, man, he was so honest right from the beginning. He came in and just bared his soul to us, and he never said a single inconsistency. Instead, they're like, yeah, he lied to us the whole time. <laughs> the whole time they were talking to him off the record, he's lying to us. So here you go, defense. Get ready to impeach him with that because you're definitely going to do that. And that's exactly how these things go. You know, when Sarah Koenig is talking about this, she, she like makes it seem weird that there's a moment where Jay's like, okay, fine, I'm going to come clean. But in reality, that's exactly how it happens. And Alice and I, I don't know, Alice might have had COVID for this, but we had one interview with a guy who we knew was guilty. Oh, I, w I was on the phone with that one. That's right. You were on I, the phone. I did have COVID, but I was on the phone. <laughs> you were on the phone. And we had him dead to rights. And we knew we had him dead to rights, but he didn't know we had him dead to rights. And so he came in. And it was exactly like this. We let him tell his story. He tells the whole story. And then we're like, okay, so explain this. And we start showing him the evidence and showing him the documents. And there was just a point where, where he literally said, okay, so you're right. I did that. And then from that point forward, he told us what actually happened. That's exactly how it goes. And that's essentially what you see here with Jay is he kind of hymns and haws and laws. And then at some point he's like, okay, fine, I will tell you what happened. And that's just, that's just how these things happen. Absolutely. The number of times I have walked out of the room, like one time, I'm not always usually the angry, the angry one. Like I'm usually the good cop, but I remember one time it was this like drug conspiracy and it was again clear 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 evidence of what this guy did and he was just spouting off you know i let him talk for like 30 minutes i was exhausted i was like this is so boring because this is all lies after the 30 minutes i handed him basically the one document that like demolished his entire story and i stood up and i said i'm gonna leave the room 
I'm going to give you five minutes to decide whether you want to talk to me or not. But when you walk out that door, it's over and you don't get to ever come back in here. And I walked out the door and I slammed the door with my agents. And when we came back, he's like, sorry, 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 sorry. Can I have a do over? And then he told the story and it was the opposite of what he had said the previous 30 minutes. But this happens so often because you know what? We probably do this in our daily lives too. I'm only going to tell like, how much do you actually know? I'm not going to tell you everything, but once I know, you know, everything, okay, I might as well tell you. Right. And so everything, this is very, basically, this is all consistent with what we see when we are talking to someone who's a potential suspect, who's a target. So the police then go on and ask if Jay had told anyone. And he said he told Jen Pusateri on the night everything happened. Remember, that is consistent with what Jen said. But at, Jay said he didn't give her many details, but did tell her that Adnan popped the trunk and there was Hay's body. He wanted at least one person to know what really happened. He said he told Jen in, quote, the car somewhere. And this, again, is pretty consistent with Jen was saying. Remember, Jen said that Jay said, it was such a burden for him to be the only person to know, and he didn't want to be the only person to know, which is why he told Jen. And this is really what Jay is saying here, too. He's saying he didn't give many details, but he just needed some other person to know to lighten his load. And he doesn't say it in the same words, but it's the same idea that Jen articulated the day before to the police. The only other person Jay would have told is Chris Baskerville. Jay thought Adnan might have told someone named Tyad what happened, and Jay said he was willing to take the police to Hay's car. The police asked Jay, why would Adnan call you? Jay said he was considered the criminal element at Woodlawn. So basically, it's not that they're close. It's just that Jay was, he, he knew where to get pot. He was known as someone who I guess could be trusted in this sort of in this sort of situation. And remember last time we were talking about Ali and what he told the defense team, he said that Jay had told someone named Taib about this. And Jay says that he thinks Adnan might have told someone named Tayed. And you kinda wonder if that's the same person. I I, I find that interesting and whether that's a overlap or or not. Yeah, the criminal element thing, I don't know. Why would Adnan talk to Jay? Talked about this before. It's a question people always ask. I think there's a certain element to it, and we've all been in this situation to a lesser extent. We've all been in a situation where we could talk with someone we didn't know that well, or someone who was more of just an associate than a friend, or someone who wasn't connected to our other friends about what was going on in our lives more than we could our actual friends. Because our actual friends would judge us and stuff, right? So we didn't want to tell them. But there was this other person in our life who actually, we could talk to that person because they didn't know us as well. And I just kind of wonder if this is an extreme version of that, where he knew Jay, knew him well enough, he knew he was kind of a criminal, and of all the people in Adnan's life, he was the guy he could talk to. And maybe he even thought if this all goes wrong, he's the guy I can blame. I don't know. Okay, so that is that February interview. Let's fast forward to March 15th. So Jay is interviewed several times by the police, and the, the February interview is pretty standard and typical of what you would expect to happen. By March 15th, though, now, you know, if you want to criticize the police, the police are in for some criticism. Alice and I had, had a very interesting experience recently. We actually were able to speak to Jay's lawyer that he would eventually get in this case. And one thing she pointed out was... It was one thing to talk to Jay that first time without an attorney. It was another thing altogether to talk to him again without an attorney. And she pointed out some things about the way this works in Maryland, how until you're actually charged with a crime or it looks like you're going to be charged with a crime, you, you can't get an attorney. So there was, some, there was a little bit of that. And sort of as long as they didn't move towards charging him, they kept talking to him. Jay's actually going to ask for an attorney in his second interview and I think Jay would have a very good argument that that interview there should have been an attorney there and if you know if Jay had gone to trial if he'd have really fought this I think he would have had a pretty good claim that that second interview is something that couldn't come in first interview he's 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 that's all coming in and that probably is the biggest problem for him is it doesn't do much good but this is where things get a little shady the police really at this point should not be talking to jay without a lawyer i know if alice and i were in the situation we would have made sure jay had a lawyer before we talked to him again yeah basically when we're talking to someone and it becomes clear that they are we advise them of this even before they start talking like by the way if you say something that's incriminating like that it's not like there's 
immunity here, right? We always say that. And when we know that they're absolutely, they've already admitted to things, like they they can face liability, they can face, you know, criminal prosecution, we tell them. And then we advise them get an attorney. Like there is no playing, you know, shady ball or anything like that. And here's the reason. It is better if that person has an attorney, if they are represented. Why? Because they can get their story straight ahead of time because memories may fade or like Jay probably did in the first 30 minutes before the recording started, you lie. And that is not in your interest to lie if if you're already admitting to certain things, right? Your attorney can make sure you have your story straight and keep you on the straight and narrow and keep you from getting in trouble with stupid lies, stupid inconsistencies, that sort of thing, and be your advocate. And we like that better because it makes a cleaner record. It's better for getting a, a clean statement. And also you don't run into problems with your prosecution later when someone is unrepresented and they clearly should have been afforded representation. And look, why why is Jim story so convincing one of the reasons is because she told it with a lawyer sitting right next to her (laughs) like how much can she be coerced with a lawyer sitting there i mean her mom's there too but the lawyer's there and alice and i have had lots of cases with co-conspirators and you know we've had them where the lawyer's there for every single thing and it makes it so much better and it was it was foolish of the police not to have a lawyer there and if they had had a lawyer there that day So much of the conspiracy theories that have swallowed up this case would have been avoided because the the attorney would have been there and could have, you know, could have spoken to some of the, frankly, crazy things you hear about this second interview in particular. So this was a huge mistake by the police, and it was probably improper by the police and, you know, a violation of Jay's rights, I think, in the end. Okay, but let's talk about the interview anyway, because it happened, and it happened without an attorney (laughs) present. So Jay was interviewed again on March 15th, 1999. And I'll tell you, this part of the story makes a lot more sense to me than his first story. He says that the day, that was his birthday, and on that day, Adnan picked him up and took him to Walmart. And on that day, Jay says Adnan told him he was going to, quote, kill that bitch, meaning, hey, this obviously is a deviation from the first interview, when Jay tells the police that Adnan told him this on the 13th before Jay had dropped him off at school. They had also been shopping on the 12th as well. And this makes so much more sense because I always wondered if Jay went shopping on the 12th, why didn't he buy anything for his girlfriend? And Jay says in the second story, in fact, on the 12th, he was picking up a gift for Stephanie whose birthday was the day after his. And in this version, Jay says he mentioned to Adnan that he needed to get a gift for Stephanie And this was what sparked the emotion in Adnan and led to the conversation about killing Hay. So it's the same story in essence. The same thing he told the police the first time. But the date has changed the day before in what I think is, frankly, a much more likely conversation. Just the idea that they're driving back to school and Adnan's like, hey, I'm going to kill Hay. She broke my heart. Just never, like, sat right. But this story seems much more believable. The Prosecutors is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Hey guys, whether you love true crime or comedies, celebrity interviews, news, or even motivational speakers, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue, right? And guess what? Now you can call the shots in your auto insurance too. Enter the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. The Name Your Price tool puts you in charge of your auto insurance by working just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance, then they'll show you a variety of coverages that fit within your budget, giving you options. Now that's something you'll want to press play on. It's easy to start a quote and you'll be able to choose the best option for you fast. It's just one of the many ways you can save with Progressive Insurance. Quote today at Progressive.com to try the name your price tool for yourself and join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law. Here's your free beauty and lifestyle hack for this episode. FabFitFun is the best way to save money on beauty and lifestyle products for the brands you love. Discover new brands and treat yourself to something nice without overpaying. As a FabFitFun member, you get exclusive access to shop thousands of curated products from top lifestyle products and brands like Fenty, Kate Spade, Glossier, and many more. 
for up to 70% off. These aren't sample sizes, low quality products, or the discontinued lines on unsold merch you find at discount stores. What's their secret? With over 1 million members, FabFitFun helps brand growth by placing massive orders with big promotions. In exchange, the brands offer up early access, exclusive drops, and steep discounts on the most sought after products. Enjoy name brand, full size products of your favorites, new brands, and one you've always wanted to try at discounted prices you won't find anywhere else. I use FabFitFun. I love it. And you should too. In fact, I'm wearing FabFitFun earrings I got in my latest box right now. They are so chic. They're not available anywhere but with FabFitFun. And I can fit them under my podcasting headphones, which is why I'm wearing them now. I also have loved the Obey Fanny Pack. I think they call it a waist pack, but whatever it is, it is awesome. I get to do my workouts with Obey and also stuff all the things I need it on the go. Sign up at fabfitfun.com slash prosecute. Customize your box and get access to discounts up to 70% off on brands like Fenty, Free People, and Our Place, to name a few. Not in love with this season's options? Take the credit to shop their exclusive flash sales of up to 70% and save on the biggest name brands out there. If you join FabFitFun as a new seasonal member right now, you'll also get 20% off your membership, so your first box is only $47.99 for up to a $300 value box each season, but only while supplies last. FabFitFun boxes sell out. Join FabFitFun today and save at FabFitFun.com slash prosecute. FabFitFun.com slash prosecute. Angie has made it easier than ever to connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. If you own a home, you know how much work it can take. Whether it's everyday maintenance and repairs or making dream projects a reality, it can be hard just to know where to start. But now all you need to do is Angie that and find a skilled local pro who will deliver the quality and expertise you need. And Alice, you can turn to Angie with confidence no matter what the size of your home or the size of your project. Whether you've got a 100-year-old house like I do where it seems like things are always breaking or if you're renting and you're needing someone to help you with moving Moving, installations or cleaning, Angie is there for you and they're there for you with confidence. So Angie has over 20 years of home service experience and they've combined it with new tools to simplify the whole process. Bring them your project online or with Angie's app, answer a few questions and Angie can handle the rest from start to finish. Or they can help you compare quotes from multiple pros and connect instantly which means you can take care of just about any home project in just a few taps because when it comes to getting the most out of your home you can do this when you angie that download the free angie mobile app today or visit angie.com that's a-n-g-i.com check them out today angie.com a-n-g-i.com in the language, I think the language that Jay says Adnan used is a little bit better too, because in the first story, it's like, oh, you know, she broke my heart and it just seems so dramatic. In this one, Jay says that Adnan told him he couldn't believe that, Ad, that Hay had rejected him and broken his heart when she told him to his face that she didn't love him. When Adnan said he was going to kill Hay, Jay still thought even at this point that he was joking. Jay then says that he told Jen Pusateri about this conversation. Which I think is also interesting, because he didn't say that in the first time. And that would mean that Jen knew about the conversation the day before the murder happened. This is obviously not something he's in the first interview. And one of the things Jay is going to come back to is the reason that these things were different was in the first interview, he was trying to basically tell the truth while protecting everyone else. He wanted to protect Jen. He wanted to protect Christy Vinson. He wanted to protect all the other people, the ancillary people who somehow had become involved in this. He wanted to tell the police what had happened without involving them. But in the second interview, he's now starting to be a little bit more forthcoming. He also said in the first interview that he did not know how Adnan got into Hayes' car. And the quote is, did he ever make any mention to you? This is from the first interview. Did he ever make any mention on how he got inside her vehicle or how he stopped her or how he got her attention that afternoon? And Jay said, no. But in this interview, in the second interview, Jay does know. He says that Adnan intended to tell Hay that his car had broken down and he needed a ride. Then he would kill her in her own car. And this is what Jay says he learned from Adnan on the 12th. And obviously that 
is sort of the story of the prosecution and the story that we've heard from other witnesses who said that Adnan asked Hay for a ride because his car was in the shop. And this would involve some planning, right, to get rid of the car so that the ruse to tell Hay that he didn't have a car and needed a ride could be accomplished. Otherwise, she could be like, no, I saw you driving your car. Your car's right there. So this is a lot more believable because there's at least some element of planning that needed to happen here. He needs to get rid of a whole car. Jay says that on the next day, Adnan came by his house at around 11 or a little after. In his first interview, he'd said 11.45. The rest of the morning is the same. They go to the mall, do some shopping, and Jay drops Adnan off at school and goes to Jen's house. Jay is more forthcoming in this interview, like we've already mentioned, and he admits that he knew Adnan was leaving his car and cell phone with him because he was going to kill Hay. Now, remember that first interview? That's a huge black box. We, I mean, there's no explanation as to why, after going shopping, he would still need to have Adnan's car and cell phone. And you can see why he didn't want to admit that. This shows that even if he thought Adnan was joking the day before, this is a step towards actually effectuating that plan, and it seems much less of a joke now. Jay also says that he told Jen that day before the murders that Adnan was going to kill Hay. Jay says that he received three phone calls from Adnan that afternoon, and he only mentioned one in that first interview. Adnan called him once to see if the cell phone was on, just to check it. On the second one, Jay told Adnan he was at Jen's house. And on the third call, Adnan actually called Jen's house, not the cell phone. And it was in this call that led him to go pick up Adnan at the mall. In this call, Adnan told him he was leaving school. Jay waited, but Adnan didn't call him again, so he left Jen's house heading to his house. But as he was driving, Adnan called him on the cell phone again and told him that, quote, the bitch is dead and to meet him at the Best Buy. So you can see basically why some of the inconsistencies exist from the first interview. This version of the story, there are many steps that show that he knows Adnan's not joking anymore about killing Hay and that there were many premeditated steps that he was a part of in order to kill Hay, even if he was not the one in this story so far to kill Hay. And obviously, Jen, who is his friend and who has nothing to do with the murders, she is kind of along the way, knowing what's going on, which is really bad for her as well. From the day before to even before the murders happened that day, she's aware of what's going on. And it's on her house phone that he gets the call to pick up Adnan after the murder has been done. And so you can really see why he would leave out certain parts of the story. And, and when he left all these things out in the first story, that's why we kind of have like a half-baked story. It didn't really make sense. It rang true, but some of it just didn't seem all there. Again, when we interview witnesses, especially important witnesses, the more we talk to them, the more their story begins to hone because it's almost like telling the truth is really hard. But once you begin to peel back the layers of the truth, it gets easier, not easier, but like, well, they already know this layer of the onion. Like, I might as well tell him this layer. It's really hard to dive to the center of the onion the first time you talk to law enforcement. We see this all the time. Some of my most complex cases and most involved witnesses who are on the law enforcement side, we talk to them dozens of times before or after a, a charging document is brought. And like, I'm talking by the 12th, 13th, 14th time, things are still changing and they're still kind of inching towards the truth. So I can already see here, he's not as scared probably because he already broke that seal. He already admitted to being, you know, an accessory after the fact in the first interview. So now he's kind of getting more to the point because they're able to ask follow-up questions like that doesn't make sense. Why did this actually happen? And, you know, it's another thing. This is another reason it would have been great if he'd had a lawyer there. Because at this point, that first interview, we're really trying to figure out what happened. But this one, which I think this is actually the third interview or fourth interview he's had with the police. At this point, you're really starting to try and get down to getting your story that we're going to tell at trial. And figuring out exactly what happened, using the evidence you have to shape the story, to confront people with their inconsistencies, to try and make them remember things to try and disabuse them of notions that are obviously incorrect 
you're just doing all this stuff. And I think there's this misconception out there that when witnesses talk to the police and talk to prosecutors, that the prosecutors and the police, the entire time, every single time they talk to them, just sit there silently and listen to them. And that's not what happens. At some point, you start to move towards trial. You know, we've done interviews with witnesses where we had mock cross-examinations. I mean, there are, you're really... You're really wanting to get that story lined up. And this interview, only this is another one, a part of it's recorded. They talked to him for a lot before the recording started. We never record our interviews, any of them. <laughs> you know, people are always surprised by that. We make a paper record of it, but we don't record it because you know what? When you have a recording device, people get really scared and antsy. And like, it kind of throws off the conversation aspect that you're trying to have with the witness. Right. And I don't know. Look, if you want to believe this is some grand police conspiracy, you can. I'm obviously going to be skeptical of that until you show me some evidence. But the things that are happening here, with the exception of the fact that police do not have an attorney there, which I think is a huge problem. Don't mistake me. But it's a huge problem for Jay. I just want to be clear here. Like, it's a huge problem for Jay. They shouldn't have done that. It was a violation of Jay's rights. And it weakens their own case. So it was stupid of them. They should have done that. But the things that are happening in general... I don't know. I don't see a lot here that's really that unusual. Do I think Jay's story is more detailed because the police are making sure it's more detailed? Sure, of course I do. But that doesn't mean what Jay is saying is is manufactured or made up. And one thing I know we've said, you know, that Jay is probably telling more of the truth here. Maybe I want to also emphasize, though, that it's not a linear line when someone talks to the police that they just get more and more truthful. Absolutely not. It's, it's a very wavy line. So, so you know, there's there's going to be additional inconsistencies. I don't think necessarily that Jay's telling all of the truth in this interview either. But you can see parts of his story make more sense in this second interview than the first one. And that's consistent with kind of what we see with people who have at least broken the seal, right? They're like, okay, I've, I have admitted to a crime already and then getting closer to the truth. But in no way am I saying that the more Jay talks to the police, the more truthful he's going to get because that is not my experience. There's still kind of a very, you know, wavy line of truth, lie, truth, lie when it comes to witnesses. Okay, so this is where he talks about the Best Buy. After Jay arrives at Best Buy, Adnan shows him Hay's body and they head to the parking lot on Route 70. Adnan puts several items in the trunk, including his track bag and Hay's backpack. Jay tries to get some weed from a guy named Patrick, but when he's not there, they meet up with a corner dealer at Forest Park and get a couple dime bags. They roll some blunts, and at the same time, Jay says that Adnan calls a friend of his, but Jay isn't sure who. Jay spoke briefly to this person. Then they head to the cliffs at Patapsco State Park and smoke. And that person was obviously Nisha. I mean, that's that's who that person is. And this is why this part feels really believable, because Nisha had no idea who Jay was. And even in this interview, Jay has no idea who who Nisha is or who Adnan is calling. But they both remember that he talks to this person. And so, I mean, that is that's a lot of coordinating between like two people who don't know each other to create a story. This, I think, because of what we know from Nisha and what we know from Ali, who probably heard it from Adnan and Jay himself. I think this call really happened. And we have the cell phone records to show it. And Nisha did talk to Jay. And Jay and Nisha do not know each other even after talking on the phone. So we're going to read you a bit of this particular interview. Jay said, while we're at the cliffs, we're standing overlooking a whole bunch of stuff at this cliff. You know, he starts telling me about how it was when he killed her. How he wrapped his hands around her and her throat and she started kicking him. And he said he looked up to make sure nobody was looking in the car at him. And he said she, she was worried about her scratching him, getting her his skin underneath her fingernails, and that she was trying to say something. He said that he thinks that she was trying to say that she was sorry, but that's what she deserved and that she had broken his heart. And that's McGillivray asked, what was your reaction? And Jay said, I asked him a question. I said, granted, you didn't like her, but you really think she deserved to die? And he said that anyone who treats him like that, anyone who could stand in his face and be that heartless deserves to die. Whew. So Jay said that he and Adnan were at the cliffs for 20 to 30 minutes. They talked about where to dump Hay's body. 
Adnan suggested the park where they were, but Jay pointed out that people were always walking through that park and they might find the body. At that point, Adnan said he needed to go back to school so he could be seen there. Adnan intended to go to track practice. Jay drove Adnan the 15 minutes back to school and Adnan called a couple people, one of whom might have been his mom. Jay dropped Adnan off and then went to smoke another blunt. Jay went to some friend's house, Christy, Vincent, and Jeff Johnson, and about 10 to 20 minutes after, Adnan calls him to get him from track practice. In the meantime, Jay had smoked some more, and Jay said that track practice got out around 545, and that was when Jay left. So a couple things about this. Number one, people make a big deal about Jay saying he went to Christy Vincent's house because he didn't go to Christy Vincent's house at that point. He's going to go to Christy Vincent's house later. And the question that people ask, and I think it's, you know, it's a legitimate question is why do he say that? A couple possibilities. One is he went there twice that day. Maybe he forgot. The other possibility is that the police thought he went to Christy Vincent's house and are kind of like, yeah, but didn't you go to Christy Vincent's house then? And he's like, Yeah, sure. I guess I did. And that sort of goes to what Alice was saying. It is not necessarily true that everything that Jay says that day is true. And it's not necessarily true that everything Jay says that day is something he actually remembers. The police would have been using documentation, various other things to try and jog his memory and to confront him with things and confront him with things and say, hey, you're telling us this, but it looks like you were at Christy Vincent's house. Did you go to Christy Vincent's house? And you could imagine him saying something like, Sure, (laughs) I probably did. I was smoking a lot of pot. I don't even know, right? I mean, I don't know. It also could just be that he was confused. It's another one of those things that's like, how important is it? I don't know. But it's, it's a thing that some people have focused on, and it's something that clearly didn't happen, because we can pretty much say for certain that Jay went back to Jen's house at this point. So when Jay picks up Adnan, he is still talking about the murder. Not surprising that, that would be the thing on his mind. Jay says that Adnan, he can't believe that he that he killed her with his bare hands. This is something he says several times. And at one point he says, Adnan says that hoods and thugs think they are hardcore, but he just killed someone with his bare hands. Jay said he took this as bragging. At this point, they go back to Christy and Jeff's. Adnan smokes another blunt. And this makes him feel a little sick. And this is consistent with the cell phone pings. This trip to Christie's makes more sense. He ends up nodding off, which is also consistent with Christie's description of how Adnan was that day. But he wakes up when someone calls him on his cell phone. Now, remember, in the first interview, Jay says Adnan hears from the police, and that's when he knows that people know Hayes missing. But in this interview, he says that the first call is actually from Hayes' family, which is, in fact, who the first call is from. They're looking for Hay. Adnan tells him he has no idea where she is. They tell Adnan Hay was supposed to pick up her cousin, but he, but she never did. And a few minutes later, Adnan gets a phone call from the police asking if he knew where Hay was. Adnan tells the police that they should check with her boyfriend, that she's a flighty person, and you never know with her. He tells the police not to call him at his home because he is Muslim and his parents would disapprove. This is something that doesn't end up in the police report, but is consistent with everything else we know about Adnan. At this point, Adnan kind of freaks out, and he tells Jay they have to get rid of the body because they are already looking for Hay. And remember, Christy Vinson is going to say that after this phone call, both of them just kind of get up and leave. They don't even say goodbye. They just leave. I think Jay actually like leaves his hat and his cigarettes behind. They, at this point, go to Jay's house. They pick up those shovels and the picks to dig with. And Adnan reminds Jay that he knows about everything Jay's been doing. He knows about all his illegal activity, indicating like, hey, if you don't help me out, if I go down, you're going down too. At this point, they go back to Hayes' car at the parking ride, and Jay follows Adnan as Adnan sort of drives around looking for somewhere to bury the body, and they end up at Lincoln Park. They park the cars, but Jay doesn't want to help Adnan, so he ends up getting Hayes' body out of the back seat, out of the trunk, and carrying it to the burial site where he starts digging. And he tells Jay that Hay was very heavy. Jay said he wasn't sure if Adnan had ever been there before, but it seemed like he knew where he was going. Adnan kept asking Jay to help, and Jay kept telling him that he didn't want to touch any of Hay's stuff, and he didn't want to help. He refuses to help Adnan dig the grave. At one point, he sees a jacket laying on the ground that he assumes is Hay's, and this is that jacket we talked about before. 
Adnan, at some point, apparently picks it up and flings it into the woods. So it takes about 20 to 25 minutes to dig the hole. The hole wasn't very deep. At this point, Jay's saying six inches. It's gotten even even less deep than it was before. Now, Jay kind of comes clean at this point, too, and switches up his story, and finally admits that, yes, he, in fact, did help dig the hole, and the work was basically 50-50. I totally believe this is true. Digging a grave is not an easy thing to do. I can say that from experience. And you would need help if you're going to do something like this. And I think Jay absolutely helped Adnan to bury this body. Now, Jay did say... Why do you have experience? Why do you have experience digging a grave, Brett? (laughs) You just said, I can say this from experience. That never happened. You're (laughs) making things up, Alice. Making things up. Okay, real quick on the 50-50, though. And this is probably consistent, too. Like, you have a shovel and a, and a pick. It's really hard work. They're probably – someone's probably throwing up and someone's digging, and then you're taking a break, and someone else kind of picks up the shovel, continues while the other person takes a break because it's exhausting work and physical work. And if they're going to get this done, you know, before it's dark in the 20, 25 minutes that he says they got it done in, it's – more likely that two people were trading off rather than he just sat there and watched. But I also believe him that he didn't want to do it. And Adnan was probably like, you know, cajoling him and threatening him even to get him to help. Maybe he even said something like, if you don't help me, this is going to take twice as long. Someone's going to pull up and find us. And you're going to No, I think that's hundred percent right. We talked about how close this was to the road. It's not that far into the forest. So they would have wanted to get out of there as soon as possible. And I think, I think Jay was, I don't even know if he had to be coerced. He probably was like, let's get this done and get out of here because I don't want to be here. He did say he didn't put any dirt on hay. He said he just could not bring himself to do that. During the burial, Adnan took a call but told the person he'd need to call them back. This is, if you believe that Adnan did it, this is Jen, Jen Pusateri. Remember, those are incoming phone calls from Jen that were answered by Adnan. And Adnan said, we'll call you back in a minute. Jay confirmed that once again, Adnan did get sick and threw up several times. So the two of them leave and Adnan wants to go to a place that he can dump the car. He suggests a few strips or places where people sell drugs. And Jay follows Adnan around for 30 minutes or so before Adnan finds a place to dump Hay's car. He grabs Hay's wallet and keys along with a black bag and the red wool gloves he'd been wearing. And they go to a dumpster behind the Westview Mall and dump Hay's stuff and the digging tools. After this, Jay says that Adnan dropped him off at his house and he called Jen to come over. But this is obviously different from both Jen and Jay's original story that Jen went to the mall to pick up Jay and that Adnan was present. But Jen picks Jay up and he tells her everything. The cops ask him why and he says that he knew Adnan would get caught. He tells Jen to stay away from Adnan and he tells her that he wants her to know the truth in case he's ever arrested. Jay puts his clothes in a plastic bag and dumped them in the dumpsters behind the H&M. He threw his boots away the next day. Jay later went back and wiped down the shovels to make sure his fingerprints weren't on them. And Jay said he later told Jeff and Christy, while the three of them were getting high, that Adnan killed his girlfriend. At this point, I think the police asked Jay the question that we all have, which is, what is his relationship with Adnan? And he says that Adnan calls him for pot, and that's basically their relationship. He, he does not ordinarily discuss relationships with Jay. They're not particularly close. The police ask him, why didn't you just call the cops? You know, you're involved in this crazy murder. You didn't have anything to do with it. Why didn't you just call the police? And Jay said if he'd been killed every time someone said they were going to kill him, he'd be dead five times over. He's basically like, look, I didn't really believe all this. I didn't really think it was going to happen. He's saying he's going to kill somebody. Fine, you blowing smoke. Whatever, sure, I'll take your car. I'm gonna. I'm sure Jay thought I'll pick you up later, and hey, you'll still be alive. He's like, this happens all the time. I didn't really think it was gonna happen. And he said that you know, once it happened, once she was actually dead, then he's then he's kind of in a in a difficult place. He doesn't have a great relationship with the Baltimore Police Department. They had hassled him a lot of times. He is essentially a drug dealer. He's been roughed up by the cops before. The the police actually focus on this quite a bit in the interview to the point that Jay finally is like, Hey, let's just stop the tape. I don't want to talk about this anymore. And and you know, like all of this is pretty consistent. Remember in the previous, when, when they asked him, why did he, why did Adnan call you? He said, I guess I'm known as the criminal element at Woodlawn. Like that statement is actually really sad to me. Right. He's, he's still a kid and a lot. He's not, he's not like a 
complete grown up here. He's still a pretty young guy. And it's almost like he's resigned and he knows who the rest of the world perceives him as, right? That statement that I guess I'm the criminal element of Woodlawn isn't I'm a criminal. It's how everyone else views me. The police view me that way. They roughed me up before. People know that I know where to get pot. Like, I don't, I, I don't hear in there that he thinks he's a criminal, but rather like, well, I'm resigned to this. Everyone just thinks I'm the criminal. So I guess I'm who everyone thinks I am. And when you're the criminal element, quote unquote, like the police are not your friends, you know, no one's going to be on your side. So it's kind of like fend for yourself. Yeah, which is totally believable that he would not tell the police anything. And the police, they're fine. The cops, the detectives, they're like, look. If you have any questions you can ask him on the tape they're not going to stop the tape I'm smart of them <laughs> it's probably not a good idea to stop the tape discuss something and then come back on and jay says he doesn't understand why he's been asked about why he didn't do anything and one of the detectives tells him they're just trying to understand his actions they're trying to figure out what was your involvement what were your motivations what were you thinking and jay says and i'll give you the quote on this first it was just like i was just like shook and then after that i was part of it I mean, I couldn't just, you know what I mean? I had just as much not called, like you said, before then, when he said he was going to kill her, to the point of when I was standing there looking at her in the trunk. I didn't call to the point of, I dig the hole. You know what I mean? It's it's all these looping together. If I didn't step out at one, I couldn't just say, well, here it is in the middle. I'm just going to call the cops. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't just going through the whole situation. I don't deal with dead bodies every day, man. I don't, you know, what I mean, that's not something I run around and look at. You know, if somebody pops a trunk and there's a blue body in there, it's going to upset me. And I'm not going to like I didn't. I don't. In my mind, I didn't think to the presence of let's call the cops. It never that has never crossed my mind. I could be getting shot at and I wouldn't be like, let's call the cops, <laughs> which once again, might be the most believable thing he says in the entire statement. At this point, the police ask him, why did Adnan kill Hay in the Best Buy parking lot? And Jay says that is where they had sex when they were still together. And according to Jay, Adnan thought that this was particularly ironic. Dude, if that's true, that's so twisted. <laughs> like, whew. So, like, yeah. And again, we've been talking for more than an hour now. If you guys have lost track, we have, we've been talking about Jay's interviews. That's what all of this is about. We are so far not parsing really through what is a lie, what's, you know, what's true, what's... We're telling you what he told the cops and kind of pointing out what he has said that may be inconsistent with the time before and what kind of rings more believable than not. But these are all Jay's words. And we have recordings of these interviews. So the detectives go through some of the inconsistencies that we've already noted from the prior interview where Jay had lied. And he didn't he said that he didn't know Adnan was going to kill Hay. That he's not told them exactly where Adon had killed Hay, left out the fact that he talked to Christy and Jeff about it, and that he lied about where Jen picked him up. The police asked multiple times if Jay killed Hay, or if he was there when Adnan did it, and he says no. The police show him a photograph of Adnan, and he says that he's wearing the jacket he wore the night of the murder. They also show him a shirt they found in Hay's car, and ask if Adnan was wearing the shirt the night of the murder. This would be a pretty good place to lie if Jay were trying to frame Adnan. But Jay says no, that was not the shirt he saw Adnan wearing. Jay then describes a brownish tan shirt with vertical stripes as the one Adnan was wearing. They show Jay a map and ask if Adnan mentioned any map, but Jay says no. And Jay says that four days after the murder, he heard Adnan tell someone that he killed somebody. But he didn't say who. So that's the conclusion, basically, of Jay's second interview. And as you can see, there's things that are consistent with the first interview. There are things that are changes. There are things that are probably straight up lies in both. There are things that, you know, I think you probably can attribute to some misremembering. And look, Jay's statements, his interviews, whether you believe them or not, are not that inconsistent with really any type of statement you would take from anyone involved in this kind of crime. If, and, I, and I'm just going to say this, like, if you are someone who thinks if somebody lies at any point, then you can't buy anything they say, then I would say that the vast majority of criminal cases you're going to have a serious problem with. Because co-conspirators, unindicted co-conspirators, those types of people this is the kind of story you're going to get. There's going to be a lot of truth in it, 
It's going to be truth that lines up with other things. And that's what's important. As we said before, you can't take any of this in isolation. You have to take the statement, take what's said, and compare it to the other evidence. Are there things that line up or not? Are there things that are consistent or not? And if nothing's consistent, well, that's a problem. Most of it's not consistent. That's also a problem. If there are some things that are inconsistent, but they're not material, we talk about materiality a lot, you know, like Patapsco State Park. I don't know when they went to Patapsco State Park. I think they probably went to Patapsco State Park at some point and talked about killing hay. I think that absolutely happened. They stood up there on the cliffs. They smoked marijuana. They talked about killing hay and what to do with the body. Was it the day of? Was it after she was killed? Probably not. But I think it happened at some point, and Jay incorporated that into that story, either because he is misremembering or because... It happened a week before, and he was like, man, I'm not going to tell you that a week before I knew he was thinking about doing this, right? (laughs) So, you know, these things aren't easy. It's not easy to figure this kind of stuff out, but we wanted to lay it out for you so you had a good idea of these, these two main statements, and there are other ones, but the two main statements that Jay gives, what was said and and what is consistent and what it what changes and we cannot <laughs> underscore enough that just because and we've said this from literally our first episode just because someone lies doesn't make them a liar nor does it mean you throw out their entire testimony we would literally have no witnesses <laughs> if that were the case and you know we always say this our you know this is like a common phrase as you're getting ready for any sort of a case to bring bring a an indictment or about to go to trial is like especially when you're talking about criminal elements and criminal actions, your witnesses are going to have problems with the law. Your witnesses are going to have credibility problems. Your witnesses are not going to be like clean as a whistle Boy Scout. Absolutely not. It would be awesome if all of our witnesses are are able to be like sweet old grandmother who has, you know, absolutely no criminal record, has never lied in her life, goes to church every Sunday and knits, you know, 12 hours a day. And she just happens to be sitting in the middle of a drug conspiracy, able to tell you everything that happened. Because guess what? The people who can tell you what happened are people who are, quote unquote, the criminal elements of society, right? There is a reason that Jay can tell us everything. It's because he he was called by Adnan. You're not going to get that sweet old grandma who has no idea what's going on in Leakin Park helping dig a, dig a hole to bury a body. That's just not who your witnesses are going to be. And this is a reality of criminal prosecution. This is why a lot of people like to go to trial because cross-examination on a witness like Jay is fun as heck for the defense. Like you can tear him apart and boy, do you right? Not just him, Jen Pusateri, just about every single witness. The defense can tear apart with inconsistencies, with lies, with their credibility as like a human being. We have seen cross-examinations just break down a witness before where they are like, I am a terrible human being. You're right. Like I don't deserve to live. And we have to like take a sidebar and make sure the case is about the defendant and not about the witness, because that is a tactic by the defense is when you're cross-examining a witness like Jay to make it about the witness on the stand and make the jury forget about your defendant and just have this be a trial about the witness. So we're telling you all of this so that you don't get on some sideshow. We're talking about Hay and we're trying to figure out who killed Hay. And these are very important interviews that you have to deal with. Because everything that's said is part of the case record. And these inconsistencies are part of the case record. And the lies and the truths and figuring out which are which are part of the case record. And we are always dealt these very complex records. And that's what we're trying to parse through here. And we have a very diverse listening base. So I'm sure some of you can answer yes to this question. But how many of you out there right now have knowledge of a, of a criminal conspiracy? How many of you out there right now could testify at a, at a drug trafficking case? Most of you are probably going to say no. <laughs> and the fact of the matter is, like Alice said, the best the best witnesses against criminals tend to be criminals because they're the ones who know about the criminal activity and they have an incentive to lie. So that's just life. And it's something that happens in every case and it happens in this case. And, and is it is it fair game for the defense? A hundred percent. This is absolutely fair game for the defense and it's something that should be brought up. And when we talk about Jay's testimony, which we should do next week, the prosecution portion The direct on Jay, pretty short. They just sort of go through this and he's done. The cross-examination on Jay lasts for like four days. He's on the stand for forever. Because obviously that's, that's, you know, the defense is going to hammer on every little inconsistency and 
and do their best to try and show that Jay is, you know, is a liar and is probably lying about everything. But hey, we got a lot more to talk about in this case. Got a lot more to talk about Jay. We got more to talk about about this interview. This interview has become famous, particularly on, you know, line on Twitter and everywhere else for tapping, tapping, tap, 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 tap on the table. And we're going to talk about that some more next week and what that means, if it means anything at all. And we're going to talk about Jay's testimony. We're going to move into Hayes' car and what was found in her car and whether or not the things in Hayes' car and the location of Case Har make you think that maybe Jay is telling the truth about some of this stuff. And I tell you what, we are closing in on finishing. I know, I know it closing in. We're like, you know, I don't want to say, you know, this was episode six in our outline. We have nine episodes in our outline. We're not quite done with episode six yet. (laughs) So I'm not going to say that we are that close to being finished, (laughs) but we're, we're closer than we were when we started. This is episode nine for you guys that you're listening to. (laughs) We're closer than when we started. I think... That's like the the most demoralizing (laughs) metric. I'm going to guess at this point, we have to get to an even number of episodes because that really bothers Allison when we don't do even numbers. So we got to get to an even number of episodes. So I'm going to say 14. 14 is my guess for how many episodes this will end up being. This is episode nine. So I'm thinking five more to go. What do you think, Alice? I always think we're going to go longer. I'll I'll go with 15 and a half. 15 and a half, so 16. 16. (laughs) There you go. There you go. You just, you know, you just never know. And look, I hope you guys are enjoying this. I know this is a deep dive, but why do you listen to true crime? The people who complain about the links of the the episodes, it's like, why are you listening to this? Like, do you not enjoy us talking about cases? I'm not, it doesn't, I don't really understand the complaints about us talking too much. That's the whole point. It's a podcast. So hopefully you're enjoying this. Let us know. Prosecutors pod at gmail.com at prosecutors pod for all your social media you know we're everywhere check us out on youtube come to facebook join the gallery i'm sure the gallery conversations about this case have been fantastic and if you want to watch us record these live and see all our mistakes and hear all of alice's crazy stories that don't make it into the final cut join patreon and you can watch live recordings and hello to all 120 of you who are watching this tonight thank you so much for joining us well alice I guess we could answer. Do you have time to answer a question or do you need to get your baby? Oh, let's answer a question. Yeah, let's answer some questions. I think baby Brittany's still asleep. Those of you who are very worried in the chat about where baby Brittany is, don't worry. She is in the house, <laughs> just not yes, in the room. Exactly. Baby Brittany. We do love baby Brittany. Okay, well, let's do a question. You guys have been great about sending questions. Thank you so much for that okay so this one is from loose filla whatever that means do y'all eschew or askew i guess depending on how you pronounce that the proper past participles to sound folksy or have you especially brett forgotten your middle school grammar lessons i hear a lot of had ran and has went on the show well (laughs) i gotta say Oh my gosh. That is a real question. Uh, is that a real, real question? question? That's incredible. I, gotta say to Luce, I I hope that I don't uh, talk like I'm still in middle school. I hope that my speech has developed a little bit since fifth grade. So, you know, if I don't follow all the rules, it might be because at this point I am able to communicate without following all the rules precisely. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> I will say, living in the South for a long time, I definitely have picked up the like the mannerisms, right? Like, I'm mm. fixing yep. to go to the store. It's supposed to just be you're going to the store, <laughs> but I, like I don't write I'm fixing to go to the store. But I definitely say well, I'm that's fixing when you're to go about to, the store. to go to the store. You haven't gone so to the store I think yet. That's, you haven't left yet, right? But but fixing like it's not like you're fixing a sandwich, you know? Like that's just not the appropriate use of it, no matter what. <laughs> But I would say I I have read Brett's beautiful legal writing and it uses the English language beautifully. He just speaks the way he does. Not to be folksy, but y'all, he is folksy. Look at this man. Yeah, I'm not trying to impress anybody. (laughs) I'm not putting on airs. What are y'all talking about? This this is me. This is me. (laughs) I think we are both like way too sleep deprived and it's way too late at night in our closets that we're no. not putting on any airs. This is no exactly airs. who we are. Okay, so let's do one more. No airs. No airs. One more question. Okay, okay. What is your favorite? This is from Soji Kimura. What is your favorite movie 
and why? Favorite movie. Oh, favorite movie. Sorry. I, I, I was looking at Leslie's chat and she's asking me Coke, Coke, pop or soda. Coke. I'm from Texas. Everything's a Coke. Of Everything's a Coke. a Coke. Exactly. You want a Coke? What kind? What kind? Pepsi. Though yeah. no one ever says what that. Kind? No what one kind? ever answers the what, what kind? kind Coke with a Pepsi because he wants Pepsi. No, no one. Is Pepsi okay? <laughs> no. Pepsi is never okay. Is the answer to that question. No, but you could have a Coke that's like a Sprite, you know? Like Coke is just the generic term for exactly. a soda. hundred percent. Yeah. Okay, sorry, sorry. I was I just had to finish out the dialect sort of answers. Okay, favorite movie. You know oh, your favorite know. movie? I'm excited. I don't know this answer for you, so I'm excited to hear it. It's not like a cool answer because you're gonna like name some like horrific horror movie that like is banned in 85 countries or something. My favorite movie because it's my favorite book of all time, and I have like a subsequent sweet story about it is the. Winona Ryder oh. version of Little Women because it's like my childhood and Little Women is my favorite book and I knew that my now husband was the right person for me when he got me the first edition of Little Women as like a present while we were dating which is like such a niche present but it was like exactly what I wanted and when I went into labor with my second child remember I was in trial and I came home and I was like in denial that I was in labor because I still had another day of court that I went home and tried to like sleep it off. And in trying to sleep it off while I was like in a lot of pain, I watched repeated trailers of the newest version of Little Women, like on repeat for like three hours before I was like, I think I have to go to the hospital and went and had a baby. So anyways, that's my very long story of Little Women and how much I love it. And I read the book like... I know you read Great Gatsby every year. I read Little Women like nice. every quarter. Yeah, I finished my most recent read of Great Gatsby last week. So it's always bittersweet. It's bittersweet. Very nice. I will say Great Gatsby is a lot quicker read than Little Women. <laughs> See, I don't know that I've ever read Little Women. I guess I should pick it up. I think your daughter would love it. It's just, it's about strong women. It's awesome. So my favorite movie is cliche, but I'm going to say it anyway, is The Godfather because it is the perfect movie. In every way. I love The Godfather. I, I, I could have seen I've that. seen it like a thousand <laughs> times. I used to, be able to basically quote the whole movie. Love that movie. It's better than the second one. People who say The Godfather Part 2 is better are just wrong. You know, there's no accounting for taste except when you say that The Godfather Part 2 is better than The Godfather. You're just wrong. Sorry. I mean, I'm sorry that you're wrong, but I hope you know you're wrong. It is not. So that's my favorite movie. Uh, you, just, you just have to like... Stick well, it it's to people, just right? when I <laughs> said that, nice, somebody, <laughs> no one said it in the chat yet that I see, but somebody's gonna be like, Well, I like Godfather Part 2 better. Well, okay, fine, it's great for you, good for you. <laughs> you like Godfather Part 2 better, it, it is not better. Anyway. Oh, my goodness, okay. Uh, and yes, by the way, you are correct, Lana. Little Women is actually a combination of two books. So when I had the first edition, I only had the, the when they were children. So the first edition of Little Women is just the first half of the movie or the book, whichever one you want. And the real whole book, I don't have the first edition of when they combined it later on. So yes, fantastic deep knowledge of Little Women and way to make me specify that I have half of it, but the original version of Little Women nice. when they're kids. Nice. So nobody's asked us what our favorite book is, but I guess we both just answered that question too. Yeah, it's kind Little of women for you. Yeah. The Godfather book is like <laughs> wackadoodle. It's not very Re good. <laughs> I, I do have to tell a really, really quick story tell though. It. it is a wackadoodle book, but really quick story though. When I when I once said I met you know the the younger generation is just fantastic, right? I love them. And I was talking to someone like you know fifteen years my my junior, and they asked me what my favorite book was and I said Little Women and this young young impressionable teenager said oh, me too I love that movie she was such an amazing prostitute and she made so much of her life and I was like that yeah, would be pretty, pretty woman. woman pretty woman yeah <laughs> And it's yeah, not a book. Not a book. Well, <laughs> it might have been a book. Might be a book now. I don't know. That's hilarious. I love it. Oh, gosh. It. Anyways, anyways. Uh, as long as you get That's out there and right. read girls, it's Pretty okay. Woman, Pretty women, woman, little women, whatever. There you go. <laughs> okay, guys. Well, I think that's all we got for tonight. Uh, but unless do you have anything else to add, Alice, before we sign off, you probably said enough. <laughs> I think I've said all enough. Right. Well, we will be back next week with another episode. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. 
and we are the prosecutors. We recorded a legal brief two days ago, and it was... Y'all should have been on for that one. Alice was... No. She was on gosh. top of it. She was, like, killing it. It was... <laughs> I was the opposite. Okay, so my baby decided to not sleep at all. Like, literally. You know, usually you get, like, the first part of the night where you get a little bit of sleep, and you're like, oh, maybe we've turned a corner. No. She woke up every 45 minutes, starting from, like, 7 p.m. until 7 a.m., and I was like, what are we talking about? What's the law? <laughs> what jurisdiction? Are we in America? <laughs> it was so bad. I'm so sorry, Brett. I literally was oh, like, was did you say something? Were there words coming out of your you mouth? Were there words coming out of my mouth? Jason will fix it in post. It's going to be awesome. Jason, make me sound Jason's not gonna subscribed. going to make you beautiful. <laughs> okay. Okay. Here we go. Sorry. Every time I see Detective McGillivray, mm -hmm. I think of McGillicuddy, mm. Lucy McGillicuddy from I Love Lucy. Yeah. McGillicuddy. Okay. Anyways, that's completely non sequitur. We should go okay. because Let's do it. ticking time bomb here. So yes, episode six. We don't have episode six open. That's what she's talking about.